let's talk about ansible lightspeed with watson code assistant my name is ganesh nalawde and i work as senior principal software engineer in ansible engineering organization hey and i am himanshu i work as a principal product manager in application development bu now before we start with all of this and uh, bring the ai into the discussion before this session ramki asked a question to the audience that what do you feel is most likely to replace our jobs and surprisingly the answer was ai ai is here to help us become more productive it's not here to replace us and that's what we are going to showcase in this particular presentation with the new product that ansible has launched ansible lightspeed with watson x code assistant uh, it is a friend it is not a competitor uh, but before we dive into this how many of you are working with automation in your day to day job raise of hands who all are uh, playing with automation on a day to day basis and how many of you are using ansible uh, to perform the automation jobs wow that's a good audience with ansible experience so before we uh, dive into the ansible light speed and how ai is going to play a big part in ansible automation going forward let us first quickly cover what is ansible and why you we use ansible to get at least at a foundational level for all the audience so look at this guy if you have seen this movie before you know we call him the dude uh, he is a devops guy in one of the organization uh, he is maintaining couple of database servers couple of backend servers maybe one proxy server and one web app server so in all he is managing around six servers he is not using automation at all uh, his app gets a deployment let's say once in a three months he is able to do whatever he want to do and chill out for rest of the time and with high traffic comes high business values so you cannot afford any down times anymore so dude is not the dude anymore he start feeling like this guy and if he continues doing everything manually like he was doing earlier what do you think would be the likely outcome the outcome would be something like this that's his infrastructure <laughs> right there one simple error in setting the permission of a file and the outcome will be like this we don't want it in our life at all so that's where we have ansible that comes to our rescue with ansible you can automate all your servers all your infra you can also automate your config for the applications you can also do the deployment of your of your application for a variety of use cases and let's be honest you can have best of the app in the world like we discovered in the first half of the event but if it's not deployed on the live environment if it's not available to the end users it's not adding any value at all to your businesses so to have a successful app it is very important to do successful deployments right first time when i was talking about edge this is the complete portfolio that you can automate with ansible you don't need any other tool to manage your automation tasks uh, one single ansible tool will help you integrate with your itsm systems automate your infrastructure cloud security networking edge whatever you can do manually ansible will help you automate that so let's just quickly see what ansible is about for those of us who haven't used ansible in the past it's a connection less very straight forward system you have a local machine on you which you will deploy your ansible and it will connect to your remote servers via ssh method perform the task and then it will close the connections there are two key things that we have in ansible one is playbook and another is inventory inventory is a file where you will define your servers along with their ip address and create the groupings of those servers so that ansible can know on which server it needs to perform the task or actions that you want to do and the playbook is where the heart of ansible lies that will contain the set of instructions that ansible needs to execute on those remote machines that's where uh, those who are already working with ansible you know we create lot of ansible content uh, via playbooks in yaml language and we execute this on our remote machines and that's where ansible lightspeed will play a major role going forward so now let's look at the playbook in some more details and uh, ganesh can you help us out with how these are structured yeah. before we have a demo actually couple of demos for you 
on how AI is going to do all of this for us so that we can focus on high value items and get right recommendation each time we create this content. A bunch of plays. So if you can see uh, a hyphen here, that means in a YAML word, it is a list. So uh, the first element here is a play. And uh, you can give a description to what you want to do. In this case, uh, we want to configure a database server. Uh, then comes a host. Uh, you need to provide information on which all uh, managed node you want to perform those operations. And these hosts comes from the inventory file that Himanshu just showed in the earlier slide. Uh, after that, the connection. Uh, since I am uh, uh, connecting to a REL server, I am using a SSH-based connection. But Ansible supports multiple other uh, connections and endpoints. Uh, to talk to basically. And uh, I will need privilege escalation here because I want to install uh, certain things that require uh, uh, using pseudo privileges and all that. So I will mention become true here. Then comes the uh, task keyword. So task is again the list of things that you want to do uh, on your uh, managed node. So uh, first task here uh, is basically you can, uh, you have, if you give the description of what, the, what you want to do, this makes your playbook uh, readable and it is a good practice to do while writing your automation content. So first thing here uh, is I want to uh, initialize a Postgres config and the thing that I'm using here is the command module. Command module is again a built-in module that comes with an Ansible binary. Uh, this basically runs a command on the uh, on the managed node here, and uh, I will be initially setting, uh, setting up the Postgres server, and it will create a Postgres configuration file. Then moving on, after this task is executed, uh, Ansible will, uh, the controller will move on to the next task, and it will start executing the uh, second task. Here, the second task is basically starting the service, and then it is using the service module here. So uh, it also explains what it is doing there. Uh, and the uh, uh, service module, the arguments for the service modules are basically name. So name uh, is Postgres, uh, state is started. And uh, after it is started, I want to also enable it. Uh, similarly, there are other tasks in this playbook. But uh, I think uh, you get an idea about what a playbook is, uh, does look like. Uh, I also want to cover some other aspects of the, uh, Ansible, uh, like the configuration file. So in my configuration file, I have defined uh, the inventory. Uh, from where I want to fetch the information of the host that I want to manage. So right now I'm using a static inventory uh, wherein all the information of the host is statically defined in a file. But you can also use dynamic inventory if you want to integrate with your custom CDB or, uh, or already the host information is av available somewhere. You can pull that from there. And there are, there are a bunch of other configuration uh, options. Uh, and this is what uh, my inventory file looks like. Uh, it is basically just a name of the group. And within that group, I can have multiple hosts. Uh, and along with host, I mentioned the IP address. Uh, then you can uh, use host was and group was. So anything that you want to define at the group level, uh, you can mention in the group was folder uh, and use the name of the group as the file name. So in this case, since I'm connecting to uh, all the rel machines, the connection is uh, same across all the hosts. That's why uh, I'm defining this variable here. And then uh, in the, within the host var, uh, you can define your uh, login credentials. So password here is hard coded just for sake of demo, but you can, uh, while working in production, it's uh, generally recommended to use a vaulted password and so on. So uh, this was a brief overview of what Ansible playbook looks like. So uh, uh, coming back to the dude uh, reference that Himanshu gave, when he decided to do automation, he still has some ground to cover. He ne still needs to understand what Ansible playbook is, what all packages he needs to use uh, for the endpoints that he wants to manage. Uh, going to the slideshow mode. So, uh, uh, so when you start writing your automation, uh, at Red Hat we believe that to get the most out of automation, we need to drive it at enterprise level. And that should uh, involve multiple teams working together to create automation code. And the code should be such that it should scale across multiple domains it should be able to talk to multiple endpoints that are part of your IT infrastructure. Uh, it should uh, meet the needs of uh, uh, various teams that are using those automation code. And the code should be trusted and well maintained. Uh, so if you see uh, the IT automation uh, is a key driver to bring operational efficiency. 
and uh, uh, if it has a potential to unlock uh, uh, unlock a lot of uh, potential for your organizations uh, to basically free up teams time to innovate uh, but to do that uh, the people who write automation they need to build, uh, build skill sets that are spread across multiple domains and uh, often the workflows that are built they are time consuming uh, and or complex to maintain and it takes a lot of effort time to build uh, these kind of expertise uh, within your organization and to solve these kind of problems the obvious solution that we looked for was at the ai part so back uh, back uh, last year we partnered with ibm to provide us with the ai capabilities uh, the goal was simple uh, it was to infuse the power of ai uh, to ansible uh, to uh, help address the growing it automation skill gap by making ansible more uh, accessible to wider swaths of it professionals and uh, people who are already writing code uh, we wanted to help them write better code efficiently and more faster uh, so uh, these are the uh, three different uh, and three main components of uh, ansible lightspeed it is uh, it requires a really simple setup nothing complex there uh, the interface here is a vs code uh, extension uh, around 2 years back uh, red hat had published a supported offering for the ansible vs code extension and it provided a lot of language specific features like uh, uh, auto completion go to uh, functionality hover functionality and then diagnostic as you write as you write code it would also do some static analysis in the background and show you the problems so for us when we uh, thought of ai uh, this was the right uh, right user interface uh, <coughs> that users were already using and it helps us help us with seamless adoption of ai so when uh, a user uh, is uh, writing their code within vs code extension basically the request when they are connected to lightspeed service the so lightspeed service is a backend service that basically provides the ai capability so when uh, a developer is writing code basically the prompt would reach out to the lightspeed service uh, it is basically a backend service that provides authentication authorization uh, related features and then it also does bunch of pre processing and post processing so when a prompt is received by the service it would uh, initially first anonymize the prompt so that uh, uh, there are no pii related information in that and after that uh, the data after the data is cleaned then it sends it to the uh, model hosting service that's where the ibm part uh, ibm watson code assistance comes into picture and that is again hosted into the red hat openshift ai uh, we have seen many uh, talks around that in the morning uh, on the uh, model side uh, we are using the graphite 3b model that ibm has uh, uh, trained uh, for their uh, as a foundational model it is a code gen, code gen model basically and on top of that we have taken high quality of uh, ansible content from uh, open communities uh, and along with that we have infused the expertise that uh, the ansible team and the, uh, the uh, ibm team had uh, within uh, within in house so once the prompt reaches to the model server it will do the inferencing it will try to figure out what the developer wants to do and it will generate a suggestion and that suggestion is received back by the lightspeed service and on that suggestion we do uh, again some kind of post processing on that so within post processing we again we try to filter out the pii information we just want to be double sure that we are not leaking any of the pii information that has gone into the model training after that we check if the suggestion that is provided that adheres to the good practices uh, that is defined within ansible community and the syntax and semantics that uh, semantic that is used it uh, is uh, to the latest of the standards and we are not using any of the legacy code after that uh, the post processing is done the uh, suggestion is displayed back into the terminal uh, so moving on uh, the while you are writing automation uh, code uh, there are different life cycle that this code goes through the first is the create uh, so create is basically creating of multiple task for your task files and uh, uh, playbooks based on natural language prompt and uh, uh, since uh, these data sets uh, are specifically trained uh, uh, for ansible purpose the ai oh, sorry the ai basically provides us with suggestions that are more accurate as compared to general purpose ai uh, let's quickly see the demo of uh, how we can set uh, the light speed and get started with using the vs code extension so i had shown this playbook uh, initially and it took me a couple of hours to develop this playbook now let's see uh, how much time it takes when i'm using ai with this 
So first thing that uh, we need to do when you have the VS Code installed is go into the extension tab, uh, type Ansible, and install the Ansible extension. So I have already done that to save time. I'm using the latest Ansible extension. And if I can see the runtime status of the extension, it is already activated. Uh, after that is done, I then need to go to the Settings tab here. Uh, so basically, you can go to File, and then there is a Preference and Settings uh, tab. Uh, type Lightspeed here, and then you will get all the configuration options that are available for the Lightspeed service. You enable the Lightspeed service, and then the inline suggestions should also be enabled. And this is the endpoint for the Lightspeed service. Uh, it is by default, while you don't have to do anything for now. After that is done, uh, you will basically have to go into the Explorer view, click on Ansible, and just hit Connect. So when I click Allow, it will take me to the uh, Lightspeed service login page. Uh, I have already logged in, so it will just ask me to authorize. Uh, it will also sh show you certain terms and conditions if you, uh, you were to ag agree that. And the, you are redirected and you are logged in now. Uh, so I am logged in as a uh, licensed user. And I am also the administrator of my organization. Uh, so you can see the uh, information here. Uh, the bottom of the screen is not visible. That's where the tab is there for light speed. It showed the prompt that uh, it's connected. OK. Uh, yeah, but I wanted to show some more things, so I'll just pull this up. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so with this setup, uh, now uh, you can see uh, in the uh, bottom tab as well, Lightspeed would have come. The document uh, type is identified Ansible, and I'm the licensed user here. Uh, so if I uh, hover on top of this, it will show me the logged in user <coughs> data details. Now let's try to generate the code here. Uh, I have the initial uh, uh, playbook, uh, uh, playbook related things already kept there. And then uh, I try to provide the national language prompt for uh, the task that I want to do. Uh, so first is basically name, uh, uh, the install Postgres server, similar to what we saw earlier. And then if I want to reach out to Lightspeed service, I would need to just go hit enter. It will trigger the Lightspeed suggestion. Uh, and hopefully, a suggestion would come back. So as you can see, uh, it showed me with the right package that I want to use, uh, the name Postgres. Basically, based on your natural language prompt, it picks up the name of the package. And uh, state is present. Now, uh, if I hover on top of this, it will also show me the model ID that is being used to serve this particular request. And when you are logged in as a commercial user, you will get uh, your own model ID value. That would be default for your own organization. Uh, so now let's, uh, so this, what, uh, what I generated right now was uh, a single task suggestion. You can also do multiple <laughs> tasks. So basically, uh, I have combined multiple prompts here, and I'm trying to uh, ask for suggestions. So first is. Uh, do uh, install Postgres config, start the service, and allow the traffic through firewall. So all these three things I want to do in a single prompt. I mentioned it in a comment. And uh, I just hit Enter. Let's see if it gives me something. As you can see, as the suggestion is being asked, you can also see Ansible lint processing files there. So it is trying to do some suggestions at the uh, some uh, validations uh, as well uh, on your machine. So. Uh, it provided some uh, content in here. Uh, it is not uh, what actually I wanted. The AI is not perfect as such. I need to make go and make some modification in here. So first task does that basically. It runs a bunch of command. There are some changes uh, required as I can see. When I tried, uh, tried it earlier, it basically provided me with what I wanted. So this should just show that AI still needs improvement and it still needs human intervention. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, next task is starting the service. Uh, it picked up the name correctly. Then it used the firewall D module that I wanted. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, with that, uh, so uh, uh, in the third task, basically, I want to create a Podman container using a PG container var variable. So this is this var is something that is defined in my context. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this uh, this variable. Uh, 
is already defined in my context. And uh, the Lightspeed service is intelligent enough to understand the context and take that context and provide me with the suggestion that is relevant to what I want to do. So if I have this in my suggestion, uh, let me try to uh, So let me try and uh, ask for a suggestion here and see what it provides. Oops. I need to uncomment this. Yeah. It used the Podman container module. Uh, I, uh, I wouldn't have known. If someone is new to Ansible, they wouldn't have known that they need to use this particular module. And the variables that are defined are then being referenced in the Jinja template as I wanted to do that. So if you are using any general purpose module, I had tried this prompt with uh, general specific AI as well. And if you use that, it doesn't provide, uh, provide me with uh, the code that is follows the best practices. For now, in this case, it is using the fully qualified collection name. That is the name of the plugin. And it also uh, mentions the collection that it is part of. That is the newer syntax that came post 2.9. But a lot of the code uh, that is available in the public repositories and on that code which are uh, used to train the general purpose model, uh, these would provide basically a single task and it won't, uh, sometimes the tasks that are provided, they might not even exist as well. So that's not the case when you are using a AI model that is uh, used for a specific purpose. So Ganesh, uh, in your last slide you showed us uh, that there is something called as content source matching. Uh, because we all are human, uh, we want to be recognized if we are publishing something and uh, that's what Lightspeed shows you, I think, uh, can you just show us that bit as well, uh, how... So, uh, coming back to your point, uh, we wanted to do this uh, because basically we wanted to build the trust uh, uh, for the developers based on the suggestion that is provided, whether they should take that suggestion, accept that suggestion or... Uh, also, we wanted to give credit to the uh, developers who have already written this code and on whose code, uh, who have decided to open source it and on based on that code, we have uh, the code that we use to train the model. We also wanted to give them some attributions. Uh, so for that, uh, to view these, uh, the content source matches, all you have to go, go do is to go into the view panel, open view, type Ansible. And it should take you, I think uh, it is already open in my system. So yeah, here. Uh, so this you can see for each task, we have provided the attribution, uh, the content matches. The t uh, top three most closest uh, source or matches are being provided here. The information of that is provided here. So you can browse through each of that uh, and basically see where it is coming from. You can click on the Galaxy link and see what is the open source code that it is used, what are the licenses it is used, whether that license matches to your enterprise needs and so on. Uh, so that's one unique feature that we have built up uh, within the extension itself. Right. And, and that's very helpful to actually realize from where the recommendation is coming and then you can take uh, your action based on the confidence that you have in the sources. Discussed earlier, we have almost 50% of the audience already using Ansible. So while Lightspeed helps you create the playbooks going forward with the assistance of Lightspeed, Ganesh, what do we have for the existing content that the content creators have created and added in their repos? Does Lightspeed is going to help us with those uh, that content as well? Uh, Ansible is a decade old project and the DSL for Ansible has changed over time. The best practices that are used in community has evolved as people have started learning and they have introdu uh, introduced newer syntax. And uh, when you have uh, such legacy code upgrading that, uh, legacy code that is working, upgrading uh, that code to newer uh, best practices, it often takes time or there is no motivation to that, uh, do that or there is no easy path to go there. So that's why we came up with a Ansible code bot. I will just quickly walk you through how to get started or how to enable that bot. Uh, yeah. Uh, so right now it is a GitHub uh, app that we have hosted. Uh, all you have to do is to go into this link, uh, Ansible code bot, uh, click on install. So after that it will ask you for which all repositories you want to install this code bot to. I will pick one repository. Uh, sorry, one organization and within that organization there can be multiple repositories and uh, you can enable the code bot on all the repositories or you can just select one of that. For the demo I will pick only one right now and I will pick up the network BGP one 
and it also shows what permissions are required from this particular repository by the board. So it will need to access the metadata and it needs uh, read and write permissions for code and pull request. So after that is done, I will install and authorize the code board. Yeah, so with my subscription, it is uh, already active and I am uh, all set to uh, run this code board onto my repository. Uh, so there are two ways uh, you can trigger this uh, code board. One is the manual way and another is a schedule format. I will show the manual way because uh, scheduling might not be possible uh, in the demo itself. Uh, all you have to do, uh, I have already said that, let me reset the topic. So in the about section, all you have to do is go add a topic here, uh, Ansible code bot scan, select that and save it. So this will, uh, when I save it, this will trigger the bot in the backend and it will take your repository and try to uh, look for best practices and uh, recommend you in form of a pull request. Uh, while that is running, I will show you how you can do uh, in a scheduled manner. For that, you need to do uh, go into the .gitter uh, .get folder. Within that, uh, you need to have this file, Ansible code what configuration file. And then the schedule here. Uh, right now, we uh, support monthly, weekly, and daily schedules. Uh, but over time, we plan to add more uh, configuration options to make it more customizable. And let's see if the pull request is raised till now. Yeah. This pull request is ju raised just now. Uh, you can review the, co uh, review the pull request and see the changes that were recommended by the code board. Uh, so basically, uh, this allows you to your team to uh, review the pull request, uh, uh, test whether things are right, uh, and then go ahead and merge it. Yeah, thanks for this. Uh, I think this is another key feature because it allows you to, one, do a scan of your legacy code, but if you do it on a monthly basis with your team, you know that all the best practices are being followed. Now, Ansible Lightspeed was only G8 a uh, couple of months back. It's a relatively very new offering. Uh, so as with any AI tool, uh, there is a lot more to be done. So Ganesh, can you quickly walk us through what is the plan for Ansible Lightspeed yeah. uh, and what we can expect? Yeah. We, we G8 just in October. Yeah. And uh, we are just getting started with AI. And there are many more things planned in the next year. The first thing obviously we have right now is the multitask generation that I just showed you and then the content monitoring code board. In near term, we want uh, full playbook generation. So at the top, you write a comment or you give description to, of the playbook and it should generate the entire playbook uh, for you. Uh, then uh, we will be supporting REST APIs. Uh, so to this will allow you to integrate uh, within your CI CD pipeline. So code board will eventually uh, also be able to reach out to Lightspeed service and recommend you uh, newer modules that are available that follows better practices uh, and <coughs> provides you with more features. All these features that can be provided using the REST APIs, you can also have add more clients uh, if you do that. Then uh, the next thing that we are planning is a model fine tuning. So many organizations, big organizations that already have Ansible content uh, that they have developed, they have their own best practices, uh, uh, they follow their own coding standards. And the suggestion that they want to provide uh, that, they, that they want to see from the AI, they would want it to adhere to those practices. That's why we will be also supporting the model fine tuning. So basically, you can uh, have your Ansible content uh, 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 taken and then uh, then uh, provided to the foundational model. And then the foundational model, we would be again fine tuning it, retraining it, and providing a custom model uh, for that particular organization. And in the long term, uh, we would want to do content discovery and optimization. So basically, when you are writing a playbook, it will just go and search that if there is a similar playbook that exists. And if a playbook is already there, it will uh, also uh, provide features like debug capabilities or if there is scope to improve that playbook, uh, such things would come. Then uh, the content description, basically, you select the playbook and you can ask the AI what this playbook is doing. It will provide you with a description of what that is doing. Then content control, so basically, uh, within an enterprise environment, the org admin can see how the Lightspeed service is being used. So we need to send some data for that to make possible. So that would be coming in control, control, uh, content controls. And then uh, newer user interface based on the feedback. If there are more IDs that we want to support this, we will be taking that as well. 
Uh, then uh, custom post processing and rule book recommendations. So we'll be covering the EDA in the next section, but we will also be able to provide uh, rule book recommendations with Lightspeed. How to get access to Lightspeed? You have been hearing about developers.redhat.com since morning. Go to the same website, uh, find under products uh, Ansible, and you will get uh, your D4i subscription started, and you will get a step-by-step -step guide on how you can start using it as of today. So it does not require, again, any uh, enterprise licenses as of now. It is available for D4i users. But if your organization is using uh, Ansible Automation Platform already, you can reach out to your uh, admins and ask them. They can enable it uh, via uh, paid versions as well. All right, so that's what we wanted to cover. Uh, yeah, so we can move to a Q&A. Uh, you had some query earlier. My question is about that, uh, um, uh, first of all that I had seen that y dot one dot yml was created manually. After that, two dot yml was created automatically mm -hmm. through automation. So first of all that I had seen the number of line of code was less in one dot yml as compared to two dot yml. So uh, I'm a bit confused here that which code we should, should to supposed to Huge because if the code optimizations level, if you are seeing the number of line of code at two dot OML has more. So in that case, architect won't support us, right? Yes. So uh, as I mentioned, the AI is not perfect. Uh, when you give an English prompt, uh, basically it tries to uh, generate a suggestion that is close enough to that particular prompt. Or it is trying to guess the intent of the user. And sometimes uh, when the suggestions are provided, that might not do exactly what you want to do. So in that case, you have to go back and try to change the English language prompt. It is basically prompt engineering. And the more details you provide to the prompt, uh, within the prompt, the better the suggestion you would receive. So in 2.yml uh, y that you are saying, it generated more commands. And be, uh, you would have to basically go and introspect. When uh, those commands you want to run, you will, uh, you will obviously know what commands you want to run. Only then you can go and automate it. So when you review those suggestions, uh, you take a call whether you want to accept it or reject it. So by uh, pressing tab, you accept it or by hit, hitting escape, you reject it. So okay, sure. based on that, uh, so we get that feedback uh, that uh, th after accepting uh, the user has done some modifications. And then at the back end, we would eventually go and try to improve the model. So eventually, as you start using it, the model becomes uh, more and more matured and starts providing more suggestions. Uh, the suggestions that are more closer to what you want to do. My second question here is, that uh, Ansible light speed is using Watson. Yep. And just now you suggested that this uh, Ansible light speed was developed in October. Yeah. Since it is using uh, Watts, uh, Watson, uh, Watson, um, IBM Watson. So the thing that it is very old, right? The first time that if any kinds of things have been discovered in artificial intelligence, that was Watson, that I know. So, yes. so since it is using this one then, why those kinds of inaccuracy there? So uh, I think you are confusing between Watson that was yeah, earlier correct, and correct, yeah. So yeah. Watson has many capabilities and one of the capability that we have added was code generation. So code generation didn't exist before as well. I mean, we started work on this uh, code generation last year. Uh, last year in October, we announced a tech preview. And uh, in May this year, uh, during the Red Hat Summit, we announced the GA that we did in October. So for all those wo all this work is very new and uh, very latest and cutting, er cutting edge that we are using. The foundational model that was generated and that is hosted by Watson X is also uh, taken from a lot of sources and a lot of programming language for the model to basically identify this is a code generation model. And when we use the Ansible and YAML syntax to do the fine tuning, the model basically started understanding that this is an YAML syntax that it wants to generate. So and uh, what we are using is uh, very cutting edge and nothing that is the thing old. I think Watson was the AI offering and it provided multiple other things in the past. But what we have right now is very uh, latest one that. So can we say that um, Ansible light speed is a kind of artificial, not generative AI? It is a generative AI, right? It is generative AI, right? Thank you. Sorry? <laughs> So uh, with Copilot, Copilot is again a general purpose thing. Uh, it is works for multiple uh, languages. And even if you try these, some of these prompt, the suggestions that would provide, they would be a single uh, task name. It wouldn't follow the FQCN and bunch of other things. So the YAML syntax that it generates is not correct. 
if you try to use Lightspeed and try to do comparison with Copilot, you will eventually figure out that Lightspeed provides more accurate Ansible uh, content because it is specifically trained uh, for that particular purpose. Okay. So does it support um, the Q&A as well? Uh, right now, no. No. Uh, so we have that uh, in uh, content explanation and all. And uh, if you see, uh, the, uh, we have analyzed uh, the user pattern over the last couple of months and we have seen that the user acceptance uh, rate of the suggestion is on the higher side. It is in 60s uh, something. So which is very high as compared to general purpose uh, AI. Okay. And it supports the other uh, modules as well, right? I mean, not just the built-in uh, modules. Yeah, it uh, works for uh, any, uh, any module that is out there on Ansible Galaxy. So the more specific you are in, a, in your prompt, mm -hmm. the more likelihood it is there to provide you with module or task that you actually want to use. Okay. And after it is provided, you accept it, you can again use the language specific features to try to understand what this particular model is doing. You can basically do go to there and see the examples and all that and try to figure out whether this is the exact module that you want to use. If not, then again, improve your prompt and try again. Yeah. Uh, hey, one question. Uh, so the main reason for why such an AI would be there is that, you know, I don't, I can, ash, I can sort of like be confident that, cool, whatever that uh, Lightspeed gave, gave out would be most optimized. Do we have a confidence factor there right now? That is, say the Lightspeed says something, if I still have to go Google it, okay, is this actually the best one? Sort so of defeats the purpose of using that. Uh, so you don't have to Google it at first. When you give the English language model, it provides with no, the task. Google the response I'm saying. Say yeah, that's what, yeah. that's what. So I'm coming to that. So when you get the response, you accept it. Obviously, wo you won't go and deploy it directly into the production. You will want to first test it on your local machine, run the playbook and see what changes you are want to do are actually done there or not. If that is not po done possible with what the recommendation it is provided, then you might want to go to Google and try to uh, get help from there. Got it. I'm pretty sure it'll be functional. Obviously, you know, a dedicated AI for this, it'll be functional, but is it optimized? Because that's the goal here, right? That is <coughs> what that's getting generated is following all the best practices that's yes. possible. So uh, the post processing step, I, the, uh, I told you in the Lightspeed service, in there we r uh, run uh, based on the, uh, so the uh, data that is used to train the model, it contains all the legacy code and uh, all the newer code as well. So the amount of new code is quite less. And uh, if more the data, more the probability of giving a suggestion in that format. So uh, uh, if in the general purpose uh, thing, it provides you syntax that are used by older Ansible version. But in the post processing, we do exactly what you are saying, the optimization part, we check whether it follows best practices. If there is a legacy syntax, we convert that to a syntax that is uh, newer, uh, to newer standard, if, or if it, uh, there is a deprecated syntax, we ensure that the latest syntax is used there. Got it. Got it. So, and you think over time it will get better because Yes, as with, as with uh, any yeah. AMS, as you use, it will start getting more mature. Got it. One final question. So, uh, is this open source right now, the full version? Because you said it's licensed, I, am it have, is that, I have this. So, there is a open source version called as Tech Preview. You can log in with your GitHub ID uh, and you can start using it. Uh, but that is uh, soon uh, will be going away, it will be sunsetting and then eventually you will uh, have to access it using the developer.redart.com to get the trial period and if you see value in that, then you can move to the enterprise Got it. offering. Thanks. Yeah, hello. Uh, I just yeah, wanted sorry. to... Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. here is one question, I will just take that. So, uh, I mentioned the fine tuning. <coughs> so, the question was, is there provisioning to uh, switch the models. So in the light speed uh, VS code setting, there is a field for model ID. And once uh, we start supporting the fine tuning of the model, so within an organization, one team might be automating a network infra, other team might be automating a cloud infra. And the uh, team that is automating a cloud infra, they might want a model that is specifically trained for cloud content. In that case, we would support the fine tuning model. Uh, at the back end, we would be generating a new model ID. Uh, that the user can come in and paste in the VS Code extension and they can start using that model. The, uh, the, in the extension, that feature is there, but at the uh, Watson X side, uh, the work is still now in progress to support the fine tuning. It will come in next couple of months. Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, can you give some ET on like full playbook generation? Because right now, this multitask generation, right? 
as you compare with other chat GPT or some BARD, so it will generate the same task, right? If you go to our website, you will see some blogs which actually compares how the chat GPT is compared to the Ansible Lightspeed and so on. Uh, it is not general purpose AI. This will give you very specific Ansible based recommendation. But your point is correct, like full playbook generation, uh, it's a near term project for us. We would expect what, uh, next summit or even beyond that. Uh, yeah, I mean work is already going on yeah. on that. So uh, hopefully by maybe let's say, let's call it like six months or so, we should have this near term plan available as well. Yeah, yeah. that's why because yeah. this is Ansible centric as you said earlier, right? Yeah. So I would love to know this ETF for this full playbook generation. Yeah. Yeah. So we all are waiting for this. Uh, it's generative AI field, right? You all are developers. You know how complex this is, how it is evolving, how it is becoming better every day. And based on the data that it keeps on getting, it will again, uh, you know, become much more accurate as we go along. Hey, um, just wanted to follow up on that. Um, one of the slides you showed the developers are the source of the task. You know, you were giving credits to the people who yeah, yeah. wrote it, right? Yeah. Um, these are tasks that are published by other developers onto Galaxy. Yes. Right? Um, if it is throwing those suggestions, how far is it that it's picking up stuff that is already existing versus actual generative AI content? And is it exclusively only going to suggest things that already exist? Or there are like true chat GPT kind of generative content as well? So it is already generative. Uh, what happens like uh, when you uh, when the AI model provides you with the suggestion, it picks some content from here, some content from here, and you cannot specifically point that this is the place it has picked the entire suggestion from. It might take one word from uh, uh, this particular, I mean from X uh, uh, X task and next content from Y task. So what we do after we get the uh, suggestion from the model, we have a uh, basically search instance that we have hosted and we then uh, send a query to that search instance and when we find we basically try to understand that from where this model might have picked the we do the closest match there is a knn algorithm that we have come up with and there is already a research paper that has been uh, in works to publish it so based on that algorithm we find the closest match if you see in the slides there is also a closest match uh, point score that was mentioned the top three that uh, the, the top three scores is what is returned in the response so the likelihood is that this suggestion I mean is coming from this particular source is on the higher side so that's the okay so for me uh, what I understand it's a mixture of things mixture and it may things. not be directly picking up from that right yeah then yeah. what is the consequence of the licenses because we've seen um, cases and yeah, so companies <laughs> suing each other over case uh, over code right that is a so great if you're providing the source and then that particular developer has a license like GPL, then if you're using it so, in enterprise. So uh, what there has been an extensive work that has gone when we developed this uh, solution. So uh, the Red Hat legal team uh, had done a thorough review of licenses uh, that were uh, used for by this code for model training. And we have picked only those data that allow permissive licenses. Uh, for this. So that is uh, one thing that uh, works in our favor as well. So I mean, we are learning from the co-pilot lawsuit. Uh, yeah. I'm not an expert here <laughs> in this <laughs> scenario, but there has been a lot of work that has gone on the legal side uh, when we came up with this solution. What yeah. about the GitLab, my, my organization that's using the GitLab? That's a good question. Uh, GitLab will be coming soon. So we uh, want to support the more major players of uh, Git hostings. So GitLab, uh, GitHub, uh, you should be able to do that. Very so let's say we have multiple versions of Ansible and some modules are like uh, older versions support and new versions don't. So how do you identify which Ansible version we support? Uh, so uh, this uh, this will basically use uh, modules that are uh, very recent. Okay. So we keep on updating the which data. Which version data. support actually? Sorry? Which version does Ansible Lightspeed support? Or does so which is the uh, you minimum can version that it supports? Uh, so let's say uh, you have your Ansible version installed on your machine that you want to use it. You accept the suggestion and then uh, basically we run diagnostic tools on the VS code and if that particular module is not supported by that particular version, it will start throwing you error there. So uh, with AI, we cannot say that this uh, yeah, suggestion works with this particular version and all. That is a lot of, I mean, I don't think that is achievable, uh, but you have to club those features with the extension features that we provide. 
to try to understand whether this module will work with, with this particular version or not. Let's say we maintain Red Hat uh, 7 servers or 8 servers, 9 servers, all with Ansible playbook. And it has to be written in such uh, differently for each of the target systems, right? Yep. How do you actually achieve that using Ansible Let's Speed? Uh, you mean uh, if, let's say, the version of the modules uh, go on and then there is replicated content? Uh, so that's that is where the, I think the code bot would come into uh, picture. It will even right now it shows uh, static time analysis, but eventually it will uh, also start recommending where when there is a newer version of collection available, whether your syntax is breaking uh, the newer version of collection that is published, and based on that it will provide you either with issues because code bot <coughs> cannot fix everything within environment. You need to fix go and fix your, but it will provide you with feedback that these are the issues with your current code as compared to the latest one. So that feedback so also will be provided. assistance is available. Yes, yes. Okay. It one will be made available. One final question. Uh, so some orgs, they don't want to expose the code to vendors. So they want to protect the code. So do you have some offering for such customers? Protect the code in the sense the We don't want to expose the playbooks. We want uh, the uh, what's and everything running in our organization, yeah. not uh, uh, somewhere yeah, in over internet. We don't want to con connect. Got expose it, the code it. to internet. Got yeah, that is also one uh, very genuine and widely asked uh, uh, question or concern. So with uh, uh, with Lightspeed right now, we are hosting the enterprise model within the customer tenant and we are not storing any of the prompt or any of the customer's data. But if there are enough number of people uh, asking, uh, customers asking for us with on-prem, uh, there are talks uh, uh, going on internally as, as to how we can start supporting the on-prem version of uh, the Watson X code model. Okay.